Let's get started. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? I'm told there's a three-day weekend. Somebody said that earlier. Is that right? Yes. Really? Yeah. When did they announce that? It's calendar. And you believe if you read it on the calendar? Well, if we stayed in, and we met in this class, then we would actually get ahead. We'd be able to finish early. What do you guys think? It's just one day. I mean, it'd just be one, one hour, probably. It wouldn't be a big deal. Huh? It'd be a big deal for you? Well, yeah, that's, what I, that's what the camera's for. I'm joking, of course. We're not going to eat. <clears throat> so um, I wish I had exams to give back to you, but I don't. Uh, so it means you get to enjoy your three-day weekend and not think about them and hopefully not obsess with them. Uh, what would you think about the exam? Good, that's good. Good, good, good. Was it, did I make it too easy? No, no nobody ever says that. <laughs> you what? Didn't like the math problem, okay. I did better in the long section. You did better in the long section? Okay. Pulling up the exact names Yeah. It varies. People like different ones, yeah. You like what? You like to fill in the blank. You guys could hit it. Or, or. No other thoughts? Everybody's ready to get done for the day? Should we dive into it and get it done? Yeah. Should we finish early? We always like to finish early. <laughs> well, finish early, then I'll do the extra credit after you leave. How about that? Whoa. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get going. So um, we uh, are in pretty good shape with where, where, where we need to be. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about uh, today on r relative to sugars is the uh, uh, pentose phosphate pathway. And the pentose phosphate pathway is um, a little bit of a confusing pathway. And um, it's one of the pathways that we're not going to follow the steps on. All right? We're not going to follow the steps on it. And the reason we don't is it's not a standard pathway. That is, it doesn't have a beginning and an end, and it doesn't go in a circle. Well, then how can it be a pathway? What is it that it's doing? All right. Well, what it's doing is it's quite variable in which direction it can go. And what determines the direction in which it goes is based on the needs of the cell. Okay. So there are some general features of it that I'd like to point out that I think that you should be aware of. One of those general features is it's one of the major sources in the cell of, of the, of the uh, electron carrier NADPH. You've seen NADPH before. And it is through this pathway that NADPH is primarily generated. You see that there are two oxidations that occur in the pathway. They're up here. Glucose 6 phosphate going to 6 phosphogluconate going to ribulose 5 phosphate. I'm not asking you to memorize that. All right? We're not going to memorize intermediates. All right? Although I think probably wouldn't hurt to know, Gesundheit, wouldn't hurt to know that <coughs> glucose 6 phosphate is in the pathway. And this is the second pathway now you've seen glucose 6 phosphate appear in. That reminds us, as I said before, that metabolic pathways are man made inventions. We don't sequester everything in glycolysis in one place. But in fact, glucose 6 phosphate is floating throughout the cytoplasm. This is occurring in the cytoplasm. And it's available freely for cells to, uh, to do their thing. Okay? So it's a source, the pathway is a source of NADPH. Well, what is NADPH used for? NADPH is used, as we will see later, primarily for anabolic pathways, that is, pathways that are synthesizing something. We will see later when we go to synthesize fatty acids that NADPH is needed to do that. There's other places it's needed as well. So anabolic pathways tend to need NADPH. All right. Well, what's all this other stuff that's going on in here? Well, look, just, I'm just going to step you through it. I'm not going to ask you to memorize these, but I'm just going to step you through it. Here's ribulose 5-phosphate produced up here. 
Ribulose 5-phosphate can go in a couple different directions, and again, these directions are determined by what the cell needs. Okay? Well, if it goes up here, ribulose 5-phosphate can uh, get converted into ribose 5-phosphate, and ribose 5-phosphate sounds an awful lot like ribose, and that's because it contains ribose, meaning that if we go this direction, going upwards, we can make ribose uh, for nucleic acids. Okay? So the pathway is useful as a source of ribose for making nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. All right. The last thing I'll point out about the pathway is that it provides a way to mix and match different sugars. Okay? Mixing and matching of different sugars. All right. Well, here's ribose 5-phosphate. I can combine ribose 5-phosphate with xylulose 5-phosphate. This has five carbons. This has uh, five carbons. And I can make something that has seven carbons and three carbons. Well, that might be useful if, my, if in the body I want to make some glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. You've seen two pathways that use glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. What are they? Glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, the only two pathways you've seen so far, right? They both use that, okay? So this might be useful for making glucose. This might be useful for energy if you decide you want to break down this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, okay? Well, we see also that these guys can recombine in a variety of ways and make fructose 6-phosphate. We can make, again, more glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So that this pathway really fluctuates depending upon what the cell needs. That's just the most important thing I will tell you. It fluctuates depending on this, what the cell needs. Those needs might be NADPH. Those needs might be ribose. Those needs might be energy. Those needs might be glucose. All of those are available thanks to the, the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay? And as I say, the direction that it goes really depends upon what the cell's needs are. Very important consideration. Okay. The pathway that I just described to you, I said we have mixing and matching. So for example, we could have those uh, uh, five carbon plus five carbons going to seven carbons plus three carbons. So that means that two carbons from one of those five carbon molecules had to get transferred onto uh, another molecule. So here's a two carbon shift. Five plus five goes to a seven plus three. Okay? These are enzymes that are found in that pathway that allow that swapping to occur. They're called transketolase and transaldolase. And based on their names, I would ask you to tell me what's being transferred? An aldehyde and a ketone, right? So these will work. Transaldolases will transfer an aldehyde from an aldose, and transketolases will transfer a ketone from a ketose. Transaldolase from an aldose, transketolase from a ketose. All right, make sure I get it right. All right, so those are just general things about the pathway. And I will come back and remind you when I talk later about the Calvin cycle, which is a very important cycle in photosynthesis, that the Calvin cycle has a lot of similarity to the pentose phosphate pathway. A lot of similarity to it. It's not identical, but many things uh, are common between the two pathways. Okay, well that's what I want to say about uh, glycolysis and uh, carbohydrate metabolism. I'd like to turn our attention now to the next phase <coughs> of energy generation in the cell. So if you recall, when we started with glycolysis, I said that we started with one glucose, and we produced two pyruvate molecules. And those two pyruvate molecules, of course, had three carbons. And I said that the glycolysis was important as an energy source, but okay, there wasn't a lot of energy realized directly as a result of glycolysis. As a result of glycolysis, we only saw two ATPs and two NADHs generated during the process of glycolysis, plus two pyruvates. And those two pyruvates are where the rest of the energy of the sugar molecule actually is stored. So we still have energy left in those pyruvates, and now we're going to oxidize those pyruvates down to carbon dioxide and get all of the energy out of them. And that happens in the citric acid cycle. Now, I'll remind you that for the citric acid cycle to occur, we have to have oxygen. Okay? We have to have oxygen in order for the citric acid cycle to occur. 
The citric acid cycle is a central metabolic pathway. And you recall when I said it was a, something was a central metabolic pathway, it meant that it was found in uh, essentially all cells. And it's central in the sense that many molecules come off of there and go into other pathways. So that's a very important aspect of it. The citric acid cycle is literally a cycle. It works in a circle. Okay? It doesn't have a starting and an end point, although we will sort of define a starting and an end point. That's where it goes. It starts, it goes, and it comes all the way back around in a circle. The citric acid cycle occurs in the mitochondrion. In the mitochondrion. So it's not occurring in the cytoplasm. It occurs in the mitochondrion. And that means that those pyruvates that we uh, produced in glycolysis have to make it into the mitochondrion. And you've already seen this happen on one occasion. Where did you see this happen? Gluconeogenesis, the very first step. Pyruvate got moved into the mitochondrion because that's where pyruvate carboxylase was, and pyruvate carboxylase uh, catalyzed that first step in, in gluconeogenesis. Well, there's a lot of other enzymes in the mitochondrion, as we shall see, and most of the enzymes in the mitochondrion are involved in oxidative reactions. The mitochondrion has uh, an interesting structure. The mitochondrion, of course, is an organelle of all cells, or all eukaryotic, I shouldn't say all cells, all eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotes, of course, don't have mitochondria. The mitochondria we describe as the power plant of the cell because most of the ATP in the cell, the vast majority of it, probably 99% of it, is produced in the mitochondria. Structurally, there are some important components that you should know. It has two membranes. It has an outer membrane that is mostly porous, meaning it lets a lot of things through it. Molecules under about 50,000 in molecular weight travel through it pretty readily. <clears throat> the more important membrane for our purposes is the inner mitochondrial membrane. And the inner mitochondrial membrane is the almost absolute opposite of porous. It won't let virtually anything through unless it goes through a transport protein. The only things that can move through the mitochondrial inner membrane easily are the same molecules that move through the plasma membrane easily. They include oxygen, carbon dioxide, okay, carbon monoxide, and water. With the exception of those four, there's not much that moves through there. Even something as simple as a proton does not move across the membrane very well at all without a transport protein. And that turns out to be key to the way in which the mitochondrion actually works. The inner membrane of the mitochondrion has many infoldings. They're sort of shown here. There actually are, and for some mitochondria, are very many of these infoldings. And what infoldings give is a lot of surface area to the inner membrane. More surface area allows more things to happen, as we shall see. The central part of the uh, mitochondrion is where what I call the soup is. All right? The soup is just the liquid of the mitochondrion, and that's where all of the enzymes or I shouldn't say all, but many of the enzymes of the mitochondrion are, in fact, dissolved. That soup is in a component we call the matrix. So the matrix of the mitochondrion holds that soup, and it's just everything inside of those inner foldings. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. Let me come back to this. Well, we get pyruvate into the mitochondrion. We want to oxidize it in the citric acid cycle. So in order to oxidize it in the citric acid cycle, we first have to oxidize pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. This requires NAD. And again, this is why we need oxygen, because oxygen helps us to make NAD inside of the cell. All right? This reaction is not part of the citric acid cycle. This is a reaction preceding the citric acid cycle. 
So the oxidation of pyruvate is a reaction preceding the citric acid cycle. Yes, sir? Does that happen in the mitochondria? This is happening in the mitochondria, and that's correct. <clears throat> now, this reaction is catalyzed by something called the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Complex tells you it's complicated, and it is. The complex mainly consists of a couple of sets of proteins that make a fairly large, complicated structure. Nothing we're going to try to draw, for example. Most of the complexity of the, um, of the um, complex itself, or I'm sorry, of, of the process itself, arises from the coenzymes that this, that this um, enzyme uses. So remember the coenzymes are non-amino acid components that help an enzyme to do what it does. <coughs> this enzyme requires five coenzymes. Five coenzymes. Okay. First of all, you've already seen NAD. That's one of the coenzymes. Second of all, it needs coenzyme A, which is written up here as COASH. The CoA part is usually what we write, but when it's not attached to something, it has a sulfhydryl group. That's what the SH is. Okay. Third thing that this enzyme needs is um, TPP. And I've talked about it before. It's called thiamine pyrophosphate. And we'll see how that works in just a minute. Another component this enzyme needs is called FAD. That's another electron carrier. This guy has two electron carriers. And last, it needs this very interesting compound called lipoic acid. Lipoic acid. Now, each of these guys have functions inside of the complex. We'll talk a little bit about them in just a minute. But pyruvate is being converted to acetyl-CoA. That converts a three-carbon molecule into a two-carbon molecule linked to CoA. There's that sulfur it's linked to. Okay? That means this is a decarboxylation. So we see carbon dioxide being given off. We also see NADH being produced. Okay? The two electron carriers are NAD and FAD. Okay? We'll see they both have roles. All right, this is. Uh, what I hope is a reasonably simple schematic. I'm going to try to keep it simple here so we don't delve too much into mechanism. But it's kind of cool what this thing's doing. Here's pyruvate. Okay? What's happening is the reason that there's multiple subunits inside of this enzyme is these this molecules are being passed through the enzyme. Sort of handed off one to the next to the next. Because they're not. Okay? Here's pyruvate. The very first thing that happens is pyruvate gets decarboxylated. Very first thing, pyruvate's decarboxylated. Now, if I am a yeast or a bacterium, that decarboxylation might allow me to release acetaldehyde. You remember that from before? Right? No? Yes? OK. All right. All right. If I'm a human being, I can't let go of it. Because if I'm a human being, thiamine pyrophosphate grabs a hold of it and won't let go of it. All right? So acetaldehyde's not released by me in this process. It's grabbed by TPP, thiamine pyrophosphate, and holds on to it. What does TPP do? It does something very simple. It transfers this thing here, this big mouth name, which we're not going to memorize. All right? It transfers this guy here to lipoic acid. Lipoic acid is attached to another subunit on the enzyme. <clears throat> when it does that, oxidation occurs. So the transfer of this molecule here, it's actually called reactive acetaldehyde. That's what people call it, okay? or activated acetaldehyde. When it gets transferred to the lipoic acid, notice what's happening. It's going from an OH here to a double bond O here. That, <coughs> excuse me, that is an oxidation. And notice what's happening to lipoic acid. Here's lipoic acid before 
the thing gets on there. It's a disulfide. Once this oxidation occurs, the disulfide is reduced because now we have an SH and we have an S attached to this. This guy got oxidized, the disulfide got reduced. That means now that the lipoic acid has extra electrons in it. The electrons came from this two carbon intermediate. What happens next? Well, next, this two carbon piece gets attached to CoA. This actually makes acetyl CoA right here. <clears throat> acetyl CoA. Well, are we done? No, we're not done because we haven't gotten back to our starting point down here. We have to be back at a disulfide bond. And once we've let this guy go, we have a sulfhydryl. Now, this is a complicated process. And I'm just going to just briefly tell you what happens. That is, the electrons get passed to FAD to make FADH2. And then the electrons get passed from FADH2 to NAD to make NADH. So we've seen several steps. I'm going to take you through the steps very briefly again. Okay? Several steps happening in this process. First, we get a decarboxylation. The decarboxylation transfers a two-carbon piece to TPP. <coughs> TPP transfers its two-carbon piece to lipoic acid. That's an oxidation. Lipoic acid gets reduced. The two-carbon piece, the acetyl group, now gets transferred to CoA to make acetyl-CoA. Then we take the sulfhydryls here. We transfer the electrons to FAD to make FADH2. We transfer the electrons from FADH2 to NAD to make NADH. The electrons now are NADH, and we're left with lipoic acid back where we started. Now, it's a several step process. The importance of this is that, acid, is that pyruvate is oxidized, acid, I can't say it, acetyl-CoA is produced, <clears throat> and NADH is produced. That's the big picture of this. NADH is produced, acetyl-CoA is produced, and pyruvate is oxidized. Now, the reason I show you these steps is it shows you something about what a coenzyme or a, a vitamin that's important in us, or a vitamin derivative that's important in us, thiamine pyrophosphate does. Lipoic acid is also used as a vitamin in our body. And lipoic acid turns out to be pretty interesting. Okay? I'll say a little bit about it later when I talk about <coughs> the stability of the mitochondrion. But there's some really interesting things being studied actually in this very building about this molecule right here. And they may have important implications for human longevity. Very important implications. Where does the poic acid come from? Um, most foods and so forth will have it. Um, I don't know of, of, high, of high sources other than going and buying a capsule of it. Um, and, uh, but beyond that, I, I can't tell you. It's going to be in food because it's going to be in every cell of the body, in anything that you eat, for example. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that's what happens. Once we've got acetyl-CoA, we are ready to start the citric acid cycle. Okay. So I'm going to go through the citric acid cycle fairly quickly. You want to get out of here quickly? I want to get out of here quickly. And um, if I'm going too quick, say so and I'll slow down. All right. Let's look at it overall. <clears throat> Here's what you've seen so far. Pyruvate has gone to acetyl-CoA. As I note, this is not part of the citric acid cycle up here. The citric acid cycle actually, actually starts right down here. Yes? <coughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, should you know every single enzyme and so forth for this for glycolysis? Um, I don't know. I get, you get to use a note card on the final exam, so it's probably not as big of a deal here, I would guess, right? You don't need to know the structures. Um, let me think about that. How about that? All right. I haven't decided. I vary it from year to year. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, focus on this guy. All right. 
Here's a two-carbon piece. As I said, this is a cycle, so it doesn't have a, starting, a start and an ending, but we commonly think of it as starting right here because this is where the acetyl-CoA comes in. Two carbons are getting ready to join this cycle. They combine with four carbons of a molecule you've heard a little bit about already, that was oxaloacetate. And you saw how oxaloacetate could be made in the pyruvate carboxylase reaction. All right? Well, two carbons plus four carbons gives me six carbons. And the six carbons I have here make a molecule called citrate, and it's this molecule that gives the, the uh, pathway its name, the citric acid cycle. This pathway is also called the Krebs cycle. It's called the, CT, uh, the TCA cycle. But today, most people call it the, the, uh, the uh, citric acid cycle. Okay. Enzyme catalyzing that, citrate synthase. <coughs> Simple name. It says it makes citrate. And that's citrate. Okay, look at this guy. Pretty cool molecule. If, if I were to make you memorize structure, which I'm not, but if I, if I were to do it, it's very simple. Carbon, carbon, carbon. Carboxyl, carboxyl, <coughs> carboxyl. And right in the middle, you got an OH. Very simple. The next step is a rearrangement. And that rearrangement moves the hydroxyl from this position down to this position. That creates a molecule called isocitrate. Still has six carbons. The enzyme catalyzing it is called a conotase. It's the only enzyme of the cycle that doesn't, whose name doesn't tell us what it really does. Okay? This enzyme is interesting. This enzyme uh, was actually targeted by a, <coughs> excuse me, by a compound called fluoroacetate that was produced back in the 60s as a way of killing off coyotes in the West. Okay. How did it kill off coyotes? Well, fluoroacetate is a derivative of acetic acid. And acetic acid, a fluoroacetate, if you put a CoA onto it, you make fluoroacetyl-CoA, meaning that you've got a CoA with a fluorine on it. Right? Fluoroacetyl-CoA, when you combine it with oxaloacetate, makes fluorocitrate. Simple enough. Fluorocitrate kills a conotase. It's an example of what we call a suicide inhibitor. This guy, fluoro, <coughs> excuse me, fluorocitrate, will actually react with the enzyme and just destroy it. Well, it was used, as I said, in the 60s as a way of wiping out coyotes out west because they were eating sheep and cattle and all kinds of things. And that was good, I guess, in a sense, if you wanted to kill coyotes, uh, but it was bad in a big sense in that many of the predator birds that ate these poisoned coyotes got full of fluorocitrate and killed many of them. <coughs> so a completely unintended consequence of that was that many of the predator birds were destroyed as a result of uh, use of that compound. It later got banned, um, but this was the enzyme that they were targeting in doing that process. Remember I said when people were designing Splenda, okay, that they were targeting things that made energy, they wanted to make an insecticide, okay? Same strategy as what this guy was doing. <coughs> yeah, it turned out Splenda, the Splenda stuff wasn't that, that um, uh, poisonous. All right, isocitrate, we've got six carbons. The next step in the process is the first of two decarboxylations that happen in the cycle two decarboxylations happen. It's catalyzed by an enzyme known as isocitrate dehydrogenase. And it's the first of our NAD to NADH, uh, first production of NADH in the pathway. Carbon dioxide is released. That's released over here. It leaves behind a five carbon molecule known as <coughs> alpha ketoglutarate. Alpha ketoglutarate is an interesting molecule. It's one of the molecules of the citric acid cycle, one of a couple that are very involved in other pathways involving amino acids. 
alpha ketoglutarate, if you replace that oxygen right there with a nitrogen, you make glutamic acid. Very easy to interconvert glutamic acid and alpha ketoglutarate. So when we saw earlier how amino acids could be used to make glucose and how amino acids could be used to be broken down to make, <coughs> excuse me, broken down to make energy in the body, here's another example. If I have a lot of, of, of glutamic acid, I can, I can convert it to alpha ketoglutarate and then run it through this pathway and get energy. So I can get energy from amino acids, from proteins, by running them through here. <coughs> alpha ketoglutarate gets oxidized and decarboxylated in the next step. This enzyme is called alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. I call it alpha K, oh, by the way, you can call alpha ketoglutarate alpha KG if you want to. And I call the enzyme alpha KGDH. Okay. Now, this enzyme turns out to be really interesting. I say that about all this stuff, don't I? It's always really interesting. I look out here, everybody's going, I'm not really interested, right? Okay. Why is this, <laughs> stop for a second. Why is this enzyme interesting? This enzyme is interesting because its structure and mechanism is almost identical to that of the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme up here. Almost identical. In fact, it uses the same five coenzymes. Those coenzymes being NAD, FAD, lipoic acid, coenzyme A, and thiamine pyrophosphate, TPP. The mechanism is almost identical. And again, we've lost another carbon dioxide. So we've gone from something that had six carbons to down here we have five carbons. Notice that the similarity between this and what's happened up here. All right? We started with a three carbon molecule that had a keto group on number two. Down here we start with a five carbon molecule that has a keto group on number two if I number from this direction. All right? When I'm done, I've lost one of the carbons. I have a two-carbon molecule with a CoA attached. Down here, I've lost one of the carbons. I have a four-carbon molecule with a CoA attached. It's just like I stuck two extra carbons in, and I have the same reaction. <coughs> Excuse me. The product of this reaction is something called succinyl-CoA. S-U-C-C-I-N-Y-L. Succinyl-CoA. Now, the next enzyme in the pathway okay, is uh, actually misnamed. Okay? It's, it's misnamed. It's named for the um, backwards reaction. It's called succinyl-CoA synthetase. But in, in this pathway, the reaction is going, it's not making succinyl-CoA, it's breaking it down. Right? Well, when they studied originally, the reason I got that name was they were studying this reaction. Okay. Succinyl-CoA synthetase catalyzes, <coughs> remember enzymes work reversibly, catalyzes the conversion of succinyl-CoA to succinate, basically meaning that you're popping off this CoA and you're left behind with succinate. Now, this reaction is the only substrate-level phosphorylation that's occurring in the pathway. It's putting a phosphate onto GDP to make GTP. So this is one place where GDP is used instead of ADP. <coughs> I'm sorry? Well, they don't need to because all enzymatic reactions are reversible. So the enzyme is properly named. It's just that this pathway is going the other direction. If, but the enzyme will also catalyze the direction going that way. Make sense? OK. Let's see. We're getting, we're getting close. Succinate. All right. Succinate gets oxidized in the next step. And this next step is the only enzyme in the citric acid cycle pathway that's not located in the soup of the matrix. 
This guy right here, succinate dehydrogenase, is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. It's the only membrane-bound enzyme of the pathway. The enzyme succinate dehydrogenase, or succinate DH, you can call it, is embedded in the membrane of the inner mitochondrial membrane. All right. Well, what's happening in the reaction? Single bonds. We pull out two electrons, two protons. We create an FADH2. Notice FADH2, not NADH. Okay. We create a molecule that has a trans bond. It's called fumarate. And we're nearing the end. Next step, we simply add water across that double bond. Simple organic chemistry reaction. Water splits. Hydrogen goes on one of the carbons. Hydroxyl goes on the other. And we create a molecule called malate, <coughs> M-A-L-A-T-E. The enzyme that catalyzes that reaction is called fumarase. And in the very last step to make oxaloacetate, malate is oxidized by malate dehydrogenase to make oxaloacetate. All right? That produces an NADH. Now, summing everything up, we have gone around the pathway. We added two carbons. We lost two carbons. They're not the same carbons, by the way. All right? But that doesn't matter for this, our purposes. We produced one, two, three NADHs. We produced one FADH2, and we produced one GTP. Now, most of the energy, that is most of the ATP, will be made when the electrons in these electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, are oxidized in the <coughs> electron transport system. We'll see <laughs> ATP being made there at least in the, in the oxidative phosphorylation part of it. OK. Now, the last thing I wanted to say right here was this enzyme is a very odd enzyme, malate dehydrogenase. It's one of the very few oxidations we see in cells that requires energy input. How does this pathway keep going if we have to put energy in to make this guy right here. We've essentially got a block right here, kind of like we had with the aldolase reaction in glycolysis. Pull, OK. And pulling would be a very good guess, Lisa. What would be pulled? How, how, would, how might pulling occur? <laughs> Removing products, OK? You're exactly right. And it turns out it's right here. This product, oxaloacetate, gets very readily pulled into this reaction because this reaction is energetically very favorable. So this concentration of oxaloacetate drops very low, very quickly, because this reaction making citrate is very energetically favorable. This reaction pulls this reaction. And that's why that, that whole process occurs. The product of this is that we have gone all the way around the cycle, we've made all this energy stuff, and we've made some useful intermediates. Now, one last thing. Exaloacetate, I mentioned it before, I'll repeat it again, is important because it is another molecule that can be used to do a couple of things. One you saw can be used to make glucose. Two, anybody remember what the other one is? Extra credit? OK, I'm going to tell you what. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you one minute to tell me. And if you do, we'll have extra credit for the day. And if you don't, we won't. All right? What is the other thing, other significant thing I said exaloacetate can be made into? And wait, wait, hold on. There's a couple rules here. The rule, I haven't started the clock yet. The rule is you're going to, I'm going to give you the opportunity to give me two answers. So I don't want to hear 50 molecules coming out of the crowd. So I want to hear a vote 
on what two answers are going to be. Go, you've got 60 seconds. What's that? Talk to each other. You plan it out. You've got 50 seconds. You've got 30 seconds. <laughs> 10 seconds. Okay, stop. Now you've got to decide. What are your two molecules going to be? <laughs> what are your two molecules going to be? PEP -E and what? I said before today. I'm going to let you know. I'm, I'm not going to take your malate. <laughs> You're just going to go with PEP? Yeah. Acid aldehyde, is that what I heard? Sure. It's one of the amino acids. <laughs> it's not alanine. It's a spartic acid. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm open-minded. Why don't you take out a piece of paper? <laughs> I think not to make people happy. This is good. It's better than beer. <laughs> okay, on that piece of paper, I want your name and I want one sentence of what you're doing this weekend. Yep. Is that? Is that it? That's it. <laughs> Please hand it to me personally. Don't give it to your friend. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Sleeping, I see, is a popular one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You didn't cheat and copy somebody else's answer. No, it's legit. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Study hard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you. And all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're smiling. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Pretty hard. All right. Got it? Thank you. Last but not least. I think we can handle that. <laughs> Just hop down here. Thank you. All right. And one last minute, two last minute. Yep. <laughs> Three last minute, okay. All righty.